Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this workshop. And uh, uh, so I was told that the first uh, few talks this morning were all theory. So this is hopefully a little bit of relief, maybe. It's going to be on, focused on practice. And uh, in particular, it's the practice of machine learning as uh, viewed through the algorithmic lens of lenses of uh, kernels and deep learning. So uh, this talk is not going to be about deep learning, but it's more the, some of the content here is motivated by the recent success of uh, deep learning. So uh, this is joint work with a number of collaborators at IBM. Uh, uh, Haim Evron on the high performance computing aspects uh, uh, and folks in the speech and the computer vision group. Uh, summer interns uh, and external collaborators, including Michael Mahoney, who's at uh, Berkeley. Uh, and then this work was sponsored by, it was done under a DARPA contract. Uh, and so there's an open source software that uh, uh, has some of the algorithms I'll talk about. Uh, so, okay, so what's the setting? It's going to be the standard uh, supervised learning setting, although uh, uh, much of what I'll talk about uh, does extend to unsupervised learning problems also. So you're given label data uh, in the form of input-output pairs. Uh, and the goal is to estimate from this uh, training set some unknown dependency between the inputs and the outputs. So, uh, so what do you do? So you set up uh, a regularized risk minimization problem. Uh, you choose a hypothesis space script H. And you're trying to fit the data uh, while finding a dependency that's not too complex, and that doesn't overfit. And the choice of this hypothesis space uh, will uh, get you into approximation estimation trade-offs, and the quality of the function that you'd learn uh, in terms of generalization error would depend on, on this choice uh, and the, the amount of samples you have, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the, the interest here is on large n, so large amounts of label data. Uh, and for that, uh, that motivates the use of big models in some sense. So we want this hypothesis space uh, to be rich. Uh, it should be able to model very complex dependencies. Uh, so we're looking for non-parametric or near non-parametric models that grow in complexity as the data comes in. Uh, and we, we want to look for non-linear dependencies. So in this setting, uh, there are at least two great traditions in machine learning. In hindsight, there are many, many approaches to formulate this problem. Uh, but the two that I'll focus on here are uh, so deep neural nets. Uh, again, this is at the risk of great oversimplification. Uh, the hypothesis space here, at least in the classic uh, multi-layer perceptron setting, is essentially uh, uh, linear transformations followed by some scalar nonlinearities, and you have a composition of these. And that's the kind of the structure of the hypothesis space in which learning is done. Uh, and the other is uh, kernel methods, uh, where we look for a general nonlinear function space uh, generated by a kernel function on the input domain. Uh, and so the talk, the, this talk will be sort of a thrust towards scalable kernel methods motivated by the success of deep learning. Uh, what is the Pardon? What is V? The v is a loss function, loss. so squared loss or hinge loss for the SVM. And gamma is going. This is sort of a spiritual uh, equation in the sense that we are trying to control the complexity of F. In, in neural nets, there are some ways to uh, avoid overfitting uh, that would not be as neat as this. Uh, okay, so I, uh, I'll start with some motivation and background. This will be kind of a relaxed uh, start to the talk. Then I'll get into approaches to scale up kernel methods, where we'll encounter this idea of random embeddings, actually pioneered by Ben Recht, who's in the audience. Uh, and we'll see that this has to be combined with distributed computation. Uh, and uh, at that scale, some interesting observations can be made. Uh, and then uh, uh, I think the best way to translate uh, theory to practice is through software. So I'll talk about uh, an open source software effort called LibSkylark, which is still under progress, but uh, it's ready for some use uh, and users. Uh, and then I'll, I'll look at some ideas from numerical analysis, uh, namely uh, QMC techniques, to improve the efficiency of these random embeddings. And then I'll conclude this talk by just some synergies between, let's say, kernel methods and deep learning. So uh, I mean, I first, by the way, this title here, 
this is not my making, it's from the New York Times. Uh, I mean, I, I first started noticing deep learning when in the 2012 uh, ImageNet challenge, which is a computer vision challenge. You have 1.2 million training images labeled with 1,000 classes. Uh, you do your training, and then you test your model on 150,000 test examples, and you make five guesses. And if you get uh, one of your five guesses right, then you, uh, that's how the error rate is or the accuracy is measured. And in this challenge, uh, Krzyzewski et al., uh, Krzyzewski, Jeff and other collaborators, uh, they got uh, an error rate of 15.3% compared to the second best, which was 26.2. Uh, this is a little bit unsettling for practitioners because typically if you, uh, if you have 50 top machine learning researchers working on a problem, you never see this kind of gap. I mean, the, the, if, if you look at the Netflix challenge, you know, ultimately the, the, the Netflix uh, prize-winning uh, model was an ensemble model that was just a little bit better than the, the next best. But this uh, is just, just dramatically, uh, uh, there's just a dramatic difference. And uh, by the way, this 15.3 person is now down to 6.6 person or something like that this year. Uh, now this is the model, so horribly, well, this is being recorded, so I have to be a little uh, <laughs> polite here. Uh, it's, it's a complex model, it's a neural net. Uh, and there are, it combines many statistical and computational ingredients and they all get mixed together in some complex way. Uh, uh, so f firstly, you have a large data set which was not available until before 2010. Uh, it has very large statistical capacity. So 1.2 million images, but 60 million parameters. So you have to uh, come up with methods to avoid overfitting. Uh, you can only do this if you train this model in a distributed environment. So they typically use GPUs or multi-CPUs clusters to do the training. Uh, this is actually important because it's a culture change in machine learning. Like you, you, you know, uh, in addition to uh, knowing how to implement, how to design algorithms, you have to be able to kind of implement it in this environment, which often becomes non-trivial or, or at least a bottleneck in terms of, uh, you know, quick prototyping. And then there is this notion of depth. Uh, there are uh, you know, several layers of uh, neurons connected uh, through these. I mean, there's a, it's a big kind of multi-layer network. And so depth is a, uh, uh, a key statistical idea in this literature. And the architecture of this network is designed to uh, impose some sort of invariance to uh, deformations or translations because it's a convolutional uh, neural network. And the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, in some sense, the amazing things here is you can train this network and you have uh, at this layer uh, a good representation of images uh, that you can then uh, uh, transfer over to other domains. So there's this transfer of features, uh, which is also very useful. Uh, so it's a form of transfer learning. And then there's a lot of engineering in terms of uh, you know, these ideas like dropout to, to avoid overfitting, and the precise nonlinearities you use across this network also make a difference. Uh, now, I mean, recently this has become a very active area, and there's a lot of work in speech and natural language processing. Uh, so you can, I mean, you can get into debates about what's new and what's old. Uh, in a sense, you can trace back the these architectures to convolutional neural nets, which were first proposed in 1980 and made popular by the work of Jan LeCun towards the end of uh, 1980s and early 1990s. And in this LeCun uh, 89 paper, they took three days to train on USPS, which has about 7,000 images uh, on a SunSpark station that had a breathtaking speed of 33 megahertz uh, clock speed and 64 MB RAM. So we are 100 times in terms of clock speed now, and 1,000 times in terms of RAM now. Uh, so well, but th that's one aspect of the story. Now I have a, some personal history here, which is that, <clears throat> so I was actually introduced, I was an engineering physics undergraduate in IIT Bombay. I was introduced to machine learning by deep neural network researchers. And the first experiment I ran was actually to train a deep neural network on UCI data set uh, wine data set, which is, I don't know, 100 examples in very low dimensional space. 
the time came to pick up a bachelor's thesis topic, so I approached my DNN uh, friends and asked them for a subject to look at, and they introduced me to kernel methods, saying that it was a more promising alternative. Uh, and subsequently, I published, uh, I submitted my first journal paper to JMLR. It was actually a neural net, feature selection neural net paper. It was actually rejected. I met the editor in Tübingen, Germany, and he told me, too much neural nets. So I went back, I added kernels in the paper, and then the paper got actually published in IEEE transactions on neural nets uh, <laughs> with a kernel methods section in it. Now, uh, why did kernel methods make a kind of an impact uh, in the mid-1990s? Uh, well, I mean, the, the machine learning problems were local minima free, so you had like in a pure, like nice convex optimization problem. And so there was a stronger role for optimization folks to get involved. Uh, they were considered as theoretically appealing in the sense that they had connections to functional analysis and you know, some nice uh, ideas kind of got together. Uh, they could handle non-vector data. So you could have kernels on, on strings and, and, and you just, you know, on the, the input need not have any structure. It could be just an arbitrary set. And if you could define a kernel on it, you could do machine learning. Uh, you could do easier model selection because the hypothesis space was not discrete. Everything was continuous, so model selection was easier. And, and in practice, they matched uh, neural nets in many settings. Although they, they never scaled very well with respect to the number of samples. They scaled very well with respect to the dimensionality of the data, but not with respect to the number of samples. So I, in 2000, around 2012, when the deep learning wave took over, I, was found, I found myself asking, what changed? Uh, I mean, is it more data? Uh, is it parallel algorithms, hardware? Or is it uh, some kind of uh, fundamental statistical idea in this notion of depth uh, uh, together with better modern DNN training algorithms? So uh, when I say DNN, deep neural nets. Um, OK, so uh, this is, these are some insider jokes between kernels and neural nets. But uh, this is just in the mid-1990s. Uh, you know, there were, these methodologies were seen as competitive to each other. This is uh, a bet between Larry Jackal who was head of AT&T Research and Wapnik. So AT&T, Bell Labs, uh, seemed like there were a co confluence of ideas and researchers working on these different uh, lines of effort. Uh, and so you know, here, Jackal bets that by March 14, 2000 people will understand qualitatively why big neural nets working on large databases is not so bad. Wapnik bets, Wapnik is the kernel guy, bets that Jackal is wrong. But if, if he can figure out the theoretical conditions, then then he still wins the bet, right? Uh, so I mean, probably Jackal probably lost this bet, but and and Wapnik said that you know no one in his right mind will use neural nets that are essentially like those in 1995. Wapnik probably got this wrong because I mean the fact of the matter is they're used heavily in the industry, so there's an enormous traction around these ideas. Now, I, you know, depending on the density of uh, deep learning uh, folks, I sometimes I skip the slide, but I'll just let you read it. Um, uh, the point here is uh, not to uh, uh, make it seem that we are, we are going after like a competition. It's just to actually find synergies between these uh, two different algorithmic ideas here. Uh, now, uh, at IBM, I mean, if you do anything other than deep learning, then you have to justify why. Uh, you should edit that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so here's my justification. Uh, so I mean, this is the way I like to explain why kernels. I mean, it's just mathematically very natural. So we think of data as elements in a vector space. We think of models as elements in a function space. Now we want to put some structure, mathematical structure, on this uh, uh, on this function space. We want to do geometry, so we want to have a notion of inner product uh, and an associated norm. And with some more technical conditions, you get to the notion of a Hilbert space. Uh, and then, uh, so here's uh, a theorem that all nice, in quotes, Hilbert spaces are generated by a symmetric positive definite function, which is the kernel on the input space. And what we mean by nice is that if, if two functions f and g are close in the sense of the distance derived from the uh, norm, then the fx and gx, the evaluation of these functions will also be close for all x. So in a sense, the norm controls the behavior of this uh, these functions uh, everywhere in the input space. And so these Hilbert spaces with this nice property are called reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And uh, because they are so foundational, uh, 
they arise everywhere, right? So they can be, you can trace their history back to the work of Aranjan and Bergman and functional analysis in the 1950s. Parson took these ideas and applied it to time series analysis in the 1960s. They arrive in partial differential equations, numerical analysis, uh, and then subsequently they found their way smoothly into machine learning, where they just arrive, you know, there's just all over the place, right? Uh, there's a complete battery of algorithms uh, based on kernels. So, uh, I mean, another reason is if you, if you want to do deep learning, then in principle it's possible to compose a deep learning pipeline uh, using functions drawn from an RKHS, right? So, even in that context, they're they are still relevant. Uh, okay, so let me now switch to the uh, more technical part of the talk. So, we'll discuss scalable kernel methods. Uh, again, so we, we have this uh, empirical, uh, this regularized risk minimization problem where the regularizer comes from the norm in the RKHS. We have chosen a kernel K. Uh, then this is an infinite dimensional optimization problem. Uh, the, the properties of the RKHS uh, imply that the optimal function will be a linear combination of these kernels centered on the uh, training points. So now let, let's just look at V equal to the squared loss. Then uh, it turns out that to compute these alphas, so you can plug this back in and turn it into a finite dimensional problem. Uh, which becomes this solving this dense linear system, where this k is the gram matrix of the kernel, uh, and it's dense typically. So the running example for for a kernel will be a Gaussian kernel. So you want to solve this linear system. Uh, this is a big matrix. Uh, you require n squared storage, uh, uh, dense linear algebra n cube, training time. And, and this really is the killer. The test at test time, given a new x prediction, requires you to revisit all your training data, and so it's it's order n d, where n is the number of samples, and d is the dimensionality. Uh, so this is not, uh, you know, it's very unappealing in the age of big data, right? So uh, and it's also hard to parallelize uh, because the kernel k i j, the elements of the kernel matrix, uh, you have to evaluate the kernel for every pair. So this, this pair has to meet at some processor, right? And so that makes it not very uh, friendly for parallelization. So we're going to look at approaches to scale kernel methods. And one way to uh, think about it is to construct a low rank approximation to the gram matrix. So in particular, we look for a feature map that takes the input data in RD and maps it to S, in this case, complex numbers. and I'll use this generality of complex numbers, although you can uh, work with real numbers uh, in practice. So you're looking for a feature map that goes, takes you from RD to RS to CS. And then SS can actually be bigger than D. Uh, and the property of this feature map is that given your kernel of choice, uh, you, uh, it, uh, inner products in this S-dimensional complex space will mimic the kernel approximately. And, and therefore, uh, what you can do is apply this uh, feature map on your input matrix X, construct a new matrix Z, uh, and, and now just do linear modeling in the space. So by using the fact that the gram matrix is low rank, you can flip things around and actually solve uh, a problem that is uh, that involves this covariance matrix in the Z, uh, uh, covariance matrix of these Z vectors, uh, and, and that uh, will let you actually. Uh, reduce the storage because you just need to compute the Z matrix. Uh, uh, the training time for just uh, just doing least squares in the Z space will be order n s square. N is again the number of samples. S is the uh, now the new dimensionality of the data, and the the test speed will actually be independent of n. So this is a way to uh, uh, kind of nicely scale things up if you had a good explicit uh, feature map. And we are going to be interested in data oblivious feature maps. Uh, then, which means that uh, the feature map here will only depend on the kernel and will not depend on the actual data, uh, because we want this operation to be very cheap. We don't want this to become a bottleneck. Uh, and and, and, and uh, if this is independent of the data, you can apply this function completely in parallel, and, and so that's nice. Um, OK, so much of this talk is actually directly inspired by Ben's work, uh, Ali, Ali Rahimi and Ben. Uh, and it, they, they, they proposed a technique to compute this feature map for shift invariant kernels. So these are kernels uh, whose values would depend only on the difference between x and z here. 
Uh, and uh, the basis of their algorithms is this Buckner's theorem that uh, gives a correspondence between the kernel and a density P. And they are related through this Fourier transform. So there is an integral representation of the kernel, of any shift invariant kernel in terms of a density P. Right? Uh, and if K is the Gaussian kernel, then this P is also Gaussian. The Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Uh, so now you can look at this integral representation of the kernel, and you can approximate this in integral by some average. So you sample points from P, and you replace this integral by the sum. And then if you stare at this, exp at this uh, uh, approximation to the kernel, you can actually, uh, from here, you can read out what the feature map should be. And the feature map should is, is essentially take x, hit it against this, a sequence of points, w1 through ws, that are drawn from this density p. Uh, and now you get s complex numbers. And that's going to be the feature map. You plug it, do linear modeling now in this space. And, and so that's the basis of uh, their approach. OK, so, uh, so we, we have a nice randomized uh, kernel, randomized mechanism to approximate kernel methods and therefore scale up. Now, at, at IBM, I mean, uh, the, the speech group is actually very heavily invested in deep learning techniques. They are some of the best practitioners uh, in, in the community. Uh, uh, and they have state-of-the-art models. Uh, so uh, we, we asked this simple question. Let's take uh, randomized kernel methods. Uh, they are shallow in the, in the DNN sense. And let's just see if we can match uh, deep neural network performance. This match will always remain in quotes because this, you know, it, it becomes a very complex business because there are tons of variations of neural nets. There are many ways to, uh, uh, many variations of kernels. And uh, we want to do traditional, traditional kernels, which means Gaussian kernel and traditional DNNs. So deep neural network with sigmoidal nonlinearities, no dropout, uh, just, just uh, you know, just standard things because otherwise we are confounding too many issues. So here's a MATLAB code that implements uh, the uh, randomized approach. So you construct this Gaussian random matrix. Then you take your input data x, input matrix x, hit it against this Gaussian random matrix, and compute these complex exponentials. You get the z matrix. And then this is just uh, the least squares uh, solution. right? OK, so now uh, here's what we get. So on the x-axis here is the number of random features. So we go from 0 to 80,000. Say a little more about the data. It's just under that top blue line, predicting HMM states given short. What does that mean? Oh, so this is actually a complex uh, speech recognition pipeline, which is composed of a hidden Markov model that models the temporal structure of speech. The hidden Markov model has transition probabilities and, and emission probabilities of, uh, of basically subphoneme states. Uh, essentially, they flip things around, and they use a discriminative approach like a uh, like a neural network to actually predict the HMM states. Then uh, they, uh, using Bayes' rule, they flip things around and actually get uh, the emission probabilities. And then they do Viterbi. And from there, they actually can decode the uh, frames, acoustic frames uh, that are represented in terms of like some short-term Fourier transform coefficients. Uh, and from there, they can get the uh, predicted uh, sequence of uh, phonemes. So, so it's a, what's the data that you're showing us a picture of? Then? So this is a classification problem uh, involving uh, 2 million uh, frames, uh, 440 uh, uh, coefficients representing the acoustic input. So this is one frame and a few frames uh, uh, you know, uh, around it. Uh, and then there are 147 uh, states of the HMM that we are trying to predict. And this is a classic uh, standard pipeline in speech. So this is the deep neural network performance. So this classification error, lower is better. This red line is uh, if you just give up and say, uh, you know, I want to do exact kernel methods. Let me just sample the data. I can do this for 100,000 samples. Uh, so you have discarded some data. You're going after exact kernel methods. You, you don't do very well, right? And now you can do randomized kernel methods. Uh, but now you're looking at the full data. But you're now working with approximate kernels. Uh, and as you pump in more and more random features, the performance improves. Uh, now, at some point, uh, you stop uh, because, well, well, one reason to stop is that this MATLAB script will start getting giving you out-of-memory errors. The first time this happens is actually pretty early in this curve. 
because the Z matrix will blow up. It's two million by, even if you have a thousand random features, it'll be like a billion, or two billion numbers. But you can get over that because ultimately you're interested in this covariance matrix. So you can kind of materialize Z in blocks and just keep adding to the covariance matrix. And therefore you can, you can kind of push this a little bit ahead. And, and, and at some point, even this trick of uh, streaming uh, incremental computation of the covariance matrix will actually won't, uh, you know, you, you start running into memory issues because now you're working with 80,000 random features. So, I mean, what we realized was we needed distributed solvers to handle both large number of samples as well as large number of random features. Oscar, can you comment really quickly? Okay. I'm sure people are confused about it. Why is that red line worse than the Fourier features? But that's just a, a sample. The uh, you want to do exact kernels, you just sample the data. So it's so like you throw away, uh, you know, most of the data. Throw away almost all of your data. Right. And now train on a, which is what people typically have been doing. Yeah. Right. Throw away almost all your data, train on a small kernel, and see how it works. Right. So go after exact kernel methods, but on sample. So this is much worse. Uh, now, I mean, the interesting thing here is even the, though the Z matrix is very large, uh, it's actually a function of a relatively small. Uh, tall and thin uh, uh, data x, data matrix x. So, okay, so we developed such uh, uh, distributed solver. We wrote up a paper which is provocatively titled Kernel Methods Match DNNs. That has led to a lot of forum discussions. Uh, and then, uh, so basically we, we ran this on an IBM BlueGene supercomputer, 256 nodes. And this gap basically vanishes, right? And in fact, if you take the the uh, the output of the model, which here this is measuring frame classification error, and if you lift it to phoneme classification error, turns out that the uh, the error rate that this kernel model gets is actually lower by one percent, which is considered significant with respect to the best DNN uh, model that uh, I did not train, the DNN experts trained. Right. Uh, on the other hand, you know the best rec the best numbers on this is among the most heavily studied data sets in machine learning and speech. Uh, and the re current record is 16.7% uh, uh, phoneme error uh, rate uh, using uh, convolutional neural nets. But there's a ton of engineering in the middle. Uh, but this is encouraging. It's the best kernel methods uh, number. And when, when things are kind of uh, you're on, on an even playing field, then there is not much difference. That's the main point here. What's the best results on the same feature set? Like, I think these guys use acoustic, different acoustic features. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, you know, it's impossible to <laughs> make things exactly. So between our DNN and, uh, and us, uh, I mean, the DNN and the kernels, we used exactly the same features. Uh, but this, this uh, record is uh, with... Yeah, but like, like, I think like, this feature set is basically standard. These, uh, like, I think th those guys actually do uh, use the acoustic waveform directly, and they don't use the right, 440. Right. Yes. Right. The, there is a benchmark where everyone uses like, the standard 440. Uh, yes, or, or variations of that, yeah. And do you have an idea how much um, better the DNN people are? Because I don't think it's anywhere near a CQ. Like, I think it's still pretty high. Which uh, what the CNN people are doing? No, but the DNN people are on the same 444 feature set. Uh, it, or any, any one of the same 444 feature set. I don't think it's that much lower than this 33, but I'm wondering how much lower. It's not that much lower. I mean, in, in, in uh, uh, Jeff Hinton's paper on dropout, he reports 19.7%. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, like uh, that—that's exactly what was discussed on the forums. With, that they, they didn't do dropout, they didn't do relu, and I mean, but that's not the. I mean, uh, the at least when things are made completely, uh, uh, you know, comparable, then we don't see any. So dropout is comparable. This is just regular addition. What's that? Dropout is comparable. Like I wouldn't have to compare. Uh, but it's a different type of regularizer, and then one can ask, you know, uh, uh, you know, do you have L two L two on both sides or? Uh, It is fair. You, you, you pull some random thing out, and then you run these squares, and then you have to compare against lots of other engineering. I mean, I think if you want to get the smallest number, you want to, if you want to make that number as small as possible, neural nets are always going to have the smallest number. And that's always been true, because they have lots of parameters, and you get to keep looking at the same thing. Yeah, but like, these things have lots of parameters, too. You can just keep adding more and more features in the suit. That's the point of this, right? No, like, that's not, I mean, okay, but what do you mean by parameters? 
Uh, well, I mean, like, there's actually a question is it just parameter counting, like, I don't these things. You, you, can count, you can count the number of things you're fitting, Sean, but I'm just saying, like, the amount of weird engineering tricks that you have to go and throw in to make one thing work versus the other. I think that's really what you want to talk about. How many things do you set by hand? And here you set a regularization parameter and a width of a kernel. Yeah, that, that's fair. But, like, I think on this data set, if you use the 440 thing and just run gradient descent with some regularization, you're going to get some number pretty reliably. And what I'm wondering is what that is. Uh, when you do, you know, drop our out your regularization, I'm wondering if that's that much better. And my memory suggests it's not actually that much better. But that's, uh, they, they made better. your point that there's an infinite conversation possible. Can you finish your talk? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, I have 15 more minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this quickly, mainly because the stock is being recorded and this is uh, actually uh, open source software. So I'd like uh, the users to know what's in the box. Uh, it's an ADMM approach for uh, distributed uh, convex optimization. Uh, again, the ADMM approach, uh, uh, and the basic idea is uh, one naive idea to do parallelization is just split the data across your nodes, train local models then do some averaging, uh, but that's not optimal. And, and the ADMM algorithms have this flavor of coordinating local models uh, to produce uh, a kind of average, get a global model, and then uh, get that global model as a prior for local model training, and you iterate a few times, and you, uh, you actually can solve your uh, convex optimization problem. There are many variants of ADMM based on how you split the data. So if you have uh, you know, large number of samples uh, relative to the number of features, then you split by rows. Otherwise, you can split by uh, by columns. And what we we kind of build on is a recent approach uh, 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 based on you know splitting by blocks. So you you this is geared towards settings where both the number of samples as well as number of features is is very large. And uh, the nice thing about uh, ADMM is that it basically the core computational primitive is uh, this uh, proximal operator, which is kind of a generalization of the projection operator, uh, uh, and and this has uh, you know closed form expressions for various functions like for L1 regularizer, it's just soft thresholding. Uh, but the ADMM framework also introduces uh, sort of extra variables, and you have to be careful in an actual implementation to manage uh, these variables uh, so that they don't blow up in, in terms of memory. Uh, so. This is just a, a kind of a cartoon of how this thing works. So you take your data is split it by rows. So these are three blocks of rows of x. That's the original input data. Uh, so these are three different nodes in your cluster. Uh, you launch MPI processes that will take ownership of these uh, uh, these blocks. And these MPI processes. So this is a hybrid parallelism environment where you have. Uh, you know, a cluster of nodes, you want to do message passing between them. And within a cluster, you have multiple cores, uh, and you want to do shared memory parallelism there. So you have multiple cores that are uh, that are then uh, spawning off, and they each have access to this transformation operator. Uh, uh, and they, you know, this thread will say, I have x1, I want the second block of z, and uh, this thing will be materialized. It'll, this z matrix will never be materialized upfront, because that's a killer. Uh, and then there are some issues here in terms of how you do, uh, how you manage like large random matrices in, in a parallel environment, and also to make things reproducible. So these threads will take ownership of different blocks of Z. Uh, they will each compute their local model. Then they'll synchronize a little bit. Uh, then these local models uh, will be reduced at a master node. The master node maintains a, two copies of the model. One copy is sort of an aggregate opinion of the rest of the workers. And another copy is the private opinion of this node. And what it does is it assimilates its private opinion with the aggregate opinion of the, the rest. Uh, it then massages its own personal opinion using the prox operator. So again, like L here is the loss function, R here is the regularizer. So if you're working with L1 loss, then this will do some thresholding. And then this, these things are shipped back uh, to the rest of the nodes, and this iteration proceeds. And you know, you, you just kind of rematerialize these blocks uh, on the fly. Uh, so the the memory requirements are are fairly low. Uh, the, the one of the key steps here is this so-called graph projection, which is just a least squares problem. 
uh, where things can be cached and uh, uh, essentially the main step here is a, a, a matrix multiplication, a dense matrix multiplication for which you can use efficient blast routines. And the main, uh, well, we, when we were working on this, we realized that there was, there was, there was a way to reorganize the Boyd and Parikh uh, update rules to allow for large number of uh, column splits, which is actually very important to reduce uh, memory and computation. And there are many variations of uh, this solver that one can look at, uh, stochastic and asynchronous vari variations of this. Now this was, uh, I mean, we scaled it on uh, thousands of cores, Blue Gene Q cores. There are two different settings in which you measure parallel performance. The strong scaling setting is where the problem size is fixed. You throw more cores at the problem, and then you look at scalability. Uh, and you know, of course, if the if the amount of work is low, is not as large, then you'd see some loss of efficiency. But this is still actually considered pretty efficient in terms of speed up. Uh, and the other setting is weak scaling, where you, uh, you every time you double the number of processors or increase the number of processors, you increase the workload at the same time, and you expect the computation time to roughly be the be the same. And that's what we observe. Uh, so uh, this thing actually scales uh, very nicely. Uh, so okay, I'm going to just also remark on the way that on MNIST, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, convolutional neural nets perform extremely well. Uh, Gaussian kernel, which is not incorporating any invariances, does not do that well. But once you use uh, a representation of images that is somewhat deformation invariant, you actually narrow this gap. Uh, the main point here is when similar prior knowledge is enforced in either framework, the performance gaps actually vanish. Uh, and again, like if, if you want to train CNNs and they work well, then again, you can use some RKHS uh, or kernel-based ideas uh, there also. And I'll just touch upon that a little later. Now, this is uh, the link to a, pack, a software uh, f a package called libskylart. Essentially, it, uh, it's designed for distributed memory systems. It runs on MPI, uh, and it provides a whole uh, catalog of sketching operators to reduce uh, a big data set that's being held in uh, as a distributed matrix, either sparse or dense. This graph, this complex graph basically says that this axis is dense and, uh, sorry, this axis is dense versus sparse and this axis is local versus distributed. So if you have a large matrix which is uh, distributed by rows across your cluster, you can reduce the dimensionality of that uh, or, or the size of that matrix, sketch that matrix to a small local matrix uh, which is dense and there are all these other combinations in this, you know, you can you have many different transforms of various different tasks. Uh, johnson lindis trust transform, uh, faster versions of it, uh, and also the, this, uh, uh, the random Fourier transform that I just talked about for, for kernels. These are many different kernels implemented in this uh, framework. Uh, okay, so uh, let me, running out of time. So I just want to mention this thread of work, which is, uh, now, if you look at the number of parameters in the, the, the random features model, it's actually, uh, the, the, the biggest model was had like around 60 million parameters, while the DNN has around 20 million parameters. So you can now start talking about the efficiency of representation. But for us, the main question here is, uh, essentially these random features arise as an approximation to this integral. And uh, how, can we do this integration better by using a different uh, sequence? Uh, so you know, this is just a Monte Carlo approach where you randomly sample from P and then you, uh, the, the root mean square error uh, goes down as 1 over root S uh, in this approach. So if you increase the number of random features fourfold, the error will be cut by half, but can we do better? Uh, and, and so th there are some very nice ideas we came across in the numerical analysis literature that can be traced back to the work of Herman Weyl in 1916 and uh, you know, the, some of these are actually number theorists that looked at the problem of uh, integration. Uh, so just to give uh, an intuition of what this is about, so consider approximating a function on the unit square uh, with, uh, with this average. And the question is, what should the sequence of S, uh, the sequence be on which you're uh, evaluating your function? So here are two choices. You uniformly draw a sample. Uh, now, in this uniform draw, there are often gaps that show up because it's completely independent sampling. Uh, you draw a sample, you, you're, uh, that sample is unaware, the next sample will be unaware of what's already been sampled, and so you, you know you can have these gaps and clusters, and and, and there are areas in the domain that are not sampled. Uh, there is an alternative approach, which is a kind of a correlated sampling, 
uh, where uh, you're guaranteed uniformity uh, with respect to some measures of uniformity. And that, that's what leads to these, these QMC techniques. Uh, and one of the nice uh, results in this literature is that you know, the integration error, as you can intuitively imagine, depends on how much f varies in your domain and how uniform this uh, sequence s is. Right? Uh, there is this uh, inequality that's classical in this literature where the, the integration error uh, is bounded by this so-called star discrepancy of the sequence s and some measure of the variation of, of f. Uh, what the star discrepancy measures is uh, you, you basically take uh, the unit square here, you, you look at boxes. Uh, this box has a certain volume, and it has a certain fraction of points. So you look at the gap, and then you, you vary this x all across your domain and look for the biggest gap. And that is the measure of the discrepancy of this point set. Now, uh, obviously, we, need, we want uh, sequences of low discrepancy. Uh, but the discrepancy can't be lower than this log s to the d by s uh, term through this kind of old result. I mean, when I looked at this, I, I thought, you know, how, how can you do better than just the, the regular grid? Uh, but it turns out the regular grid is only optimal uh, for d equal to 1. I mean, the star discrepancy uh, is above 1 over, I mean, s to the 1 over d. So regular grid is actually not, uh, not optimal. I mean, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, the, if you choose the sequence uh, uniformly, then the expected uh, star discrepancy is, uh, goes as 1 over root s, which is back to the Monte Carlo rate. And the main thing is, in this literature, is uh, uh, this community has constructed these low discrepancy sequences that achieve this bound. And we are going to treat these sequences as black boxes. You can actually access them through MATLAB. Uh, but this, this bound is actually hopeless, because it actually increases until you get exponentially large. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this community has also found that QMC is actually very effective. This title is from a recent talk by, I think, Ian Sloan on the unreasonable effectiveness of QMC. It's still effective in high dimensions. It beats Monte Carlo rate, but it cannot be explained by the classical analysis. And this is an example of how kernels and RKHSs, the generality shows up in different fields. It, in fact, one way of analyzing uh, uh, sequences, QMC sequences, actually is through uh, the, uh, if you assume that your, the space of your integrands is an RKHS, then you can do better. And uh, this RKHSs and kernels show up in a completely different context in this uh, literature also. So you can take uh, these QMC sequences, plug it into, so it's easy to generalize uh, Ben's algorithm uh, to use QMC sequences, and you immediately actually get better re reconstruction of the gram matrix using QMC uh, sequences. Uh, but then, you know, some sequ so this 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 curve on the top is uh, the Monte Carlo curve. That's the standard algorithm, and uh, these are different QMC sequences. Uh, so we find that uh, you know QMC sequences all, uh, consistently give better reconstruction. But then some sequences are better than the others, and it's not clear why. You know, why should one sequence say Halton is better than Sobol? Uh, and then it leads to this question of uh, I mean, if if the if we were aware of the class of integrands we, we want to go after, can we do better? And uh, so this is a, a quick overview of uh, R, how RKHSs arrive, arise in QMC theory. So you have, uh, you know, you're looking at nice integrands uh, that live in an RKHS associated, associated with a kernel. Now this is just, uh, you, you, this is the integration error. And essentially by reproducing property in Cauchy-Schwarz, you can bound this by the, uh, the norm of f this k should be h, by the way, times uh, something that is a new uh, discrepancy measure. And this discrep discrepancy measure is simply the difference between a function in the RKHS and the average function uh, kind of centered on the, uh, if you just average this, these uh, kernel uh, on, on, on your sequence s, and you look at the distance uh, uh, in the norm uh, associated with this uh, space, uh, that's the discrepancy, right? Uh, and this, this quantity here uh, is actually uh, the mean embedding. This shows up in uh, RKHS embedding of probability distribution. It's a completely different uh, uh, context in machine learning. Uh, but this is a, a neat kind of a discrepancy measure that tells you the worst case error in an RKHS. So if, if you're looking at a ball in, in an RKHS, then this, is, this quantity will bound the integration error. Uh, so you can expand this, and you can see that uh, if you want to minimize this discrepancy, then you're trying to actually uh, maximize dissimilarity, pairwise dis dissimilarity as measured through the kernel. At the same time, you're trying to align your samples with, with the density. 
so uh, I mean, these kind of intuitions lead us to a new measure. So the, the functions that we are interested in are actually, uh, the, the, the fun so assume that the data lives in a box, then these are the functions we are interested in integrating. Uh, and, and it turns out that we can uh, uh, show that if you randomly draw uh, uniformly from this set, then the root mean square error is proportional to exactly this uh, this uh, discrepancy, but associated with the sink kernel. And actually, it turns out you can evaluate the discrepancy exactly for the Gaussian density. And then you can uh, plug all the sequences in. And actually, it, it turns out we call this, this uh, term was coined by my co-author, box discrepancy. Uh, it turns out it actually does explain the difference between different QMC sequences. Uh, and what you can also do is optimize this, because unlike the star discrepancy, this is continuous. So you can actually compute gradients, and you can uh, optimize. So this is like an adaptive sequence that is aware of the problem that we're trying to solve. And uh, again, like this, uh, this red curve is, so we are doing optimization. Uh, and this uh, y-axis is some uh, different measures here. So as you optimize the star discrepancy, the quality of the, and if you initialize this optimization, it's a non-convex optimization with the Halton sequence, which is the best, uh, best standard QMC sequence, you can improve the reconstruction in the gram matrix. Um, so I'm running out of time here. Uh, just a few points about synergies. Uh, this is, actually it turns out uh, you can give a neural network interpretation to the random features technique, right? I mean, uh, except that, so th these are the inputs. These are your random features. These are your outputs. Uh, but, but in some sense, uh, you have, you know, what nonlinearity should you use in the hidden layer? Uh, you, can, you can justify these complex exponentials through the Bachner's theorem. As you take this hidden layer to infinity, we can exactly say that this neural network represents the, the class of functions generated by the Gaussian kernel or, or the shift invariant kernel you care about. The first layer here is randomized. Uh, the weights are drawn from some density that's associated with the kernel. And the second layer is optimized. So there is this uh, issue of randomization versus optimization. It turns out in deep learning literature, they have uh, found examples of convolutional neural nets. Uh, so there are papers like this that say, so they were looking at uh, different convolutional neural nets, and they found that uh, the most astonishing result is that systems with random filters and no filter learning whatsoever achieve decent performance. And uh, so in some sense, uh, so there's another paper that tried to analyze why these random uh, you know, setting, uh, keeping things random actually is not that bad. A surprising fraction of the performance. So if you get the architecture right, uh, you can you can be uh, you can replace optimization with randomization, and I think that's a kind of an interesting theme to build on. And, and there are also opportunities for kind of doing some theoretical work here, I suppose. Uh, and again, like there's recent work, kind of in the middle of deep learning and kernels, where you're looking at a multi-layer network, but now instead of uh, kind of linear functions that uh, followed by scalar nonlinearities that bring you from one layer to another. You can use uh, more general nonlinear mappings defined through the kernel. And these are some recent papers. Actually, Lorenzo has done some work uh, also on this. But these two are actually very recent uh, works. And actually, they show that when you generalize uh, using the insights from deep learning and kernels, you can compute uh, uh, kind of convolutional neural nets that are much more compact and give you the same performance. Uh, but uh, I think the subject is ripe for some theoretical investigation. So here's some conclusions. Uh, again, I'll be measured in my conclusion in the sense that well, some empirical evidence suggests that once you scale kernels and embody the same statistical principles uh, as, in, and, as in demonstrations of deep learning, uh, you, you get competitive results. And uh, here it's important to combine both these randomized low rank approximations with distributed computation. You know, doing one and not the other is not enough. Uh, and uh, we didn't we explored QMC integration ideas. We, the, the results were very promising, but we have not explored the applicability in large scale problems. Uh, and I think there are some opportunities for designing, as I said, uh, 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 new algorithms combining insights from deep learning with the kind of the ma mathematical richness of kernel kernel methods. So okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. So I wonder, do you find when you have this reduced exact calculation for kernel, 
Did you try to do different subs and do bagging to see how much that improved the product? Uh, no, we didn't try that. And in terms of running time, you said your running time. How did you compare with the deep learning running time? Oh, that is a complicated uh, comparison because uh, these are both distributed implementations and the deep learning implementation was on GPUs, ours was on a, a multi-CPU, blue gene queue, and high performance implementation is just very hard to compare. But our estimate is that they, are, they will be comparable. Uh, and, and it depends also on the number of random features. And, and uh, again, as I said, there are many ways to compress that using, let's say, QMC ideas. Uh, and so it, you know, it would depend on how, how much compression we get. Uh, so it's a fairly complex uh, question to answer. But the real-time running time, how, how does it explain? Uh, the deep neural network running time is very hard to characterize, uh, I think. Because they do stochastic gradient descent, it's non-convex. I'm not, is there anything that we can say about it? It's exactly, in practice, how long does it take to train? Uh, uh, I, 10 days. <laughs> So uh, it took us two hours on 256 uh, nodes. And Did you chew a lot? No, not at all. The deep learning, you didn't uh, tweak? No, I mean, I, I did not. We didn't. The kernels was very simple. The bandwidth in just do some experiments, figure out the uh, just uh, kind of a heuristic way to select. Deep For deep learning, we had an intern spend four months just trying to get the best neural net. Uh, oh. Yeah, but again, like, you know, it's, it's a hard question, is it? Like, if you're in the ballpark, kind of everything works, and if you're wrong, there's, like, infinities everywhere. And the thing Vikas is talking about, like, yes, he's tweaking these things to get them working in distributed settings, but, you know, they're really convex at the end of the day, so we can kind of get them to run. So, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to this your point. Like, it, it, it is really hard to compare these things, and, um, yeah. No, it's one of the two tools actually. Because it's kind of tricky. How do you create this sampling where every node needs to be aware of which segment is looking at right now? So, uh, I mean, I won't go into the QMC generators. They're actually very cheap to generate. Uh, but you, you are, because every node now has, to me, has a small partition of the whole space. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the construction of these uh, sequences is well. Actually, the standard sequences is not not expensive at all. Uh, but I'm not aware of the actual details. I mean, these are kind of complex constructions in some cases. We, in fact, treated this completely as black box. I cannot tell you what those sequences are. Like, I cannot actually write down on the board how they are constructed. But I know that they actually run. Uh, it's very cheap to construct them computationally. Uh, so it's on the to-do list for Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. So this is partly like to Ben's question about uh, compactness of representations. And like in these random features, they're just sometimes like simple tricks one can play that shape off like factors of two to four and a uh, number of features that you need to use. But right. this is significant in terms of runtime, which is the bottleneck here. Right. And you know, so, so like you have an idea or intuition, like if you really pushed hard on just tweaks to get a more compact representation. Uh, like how much lower could you get that curve? And just suppose you just let, let it run forever because, you know, like one empirical question with these, you know, in this setting, let's just forget, forget about the representational issue of how many parameters you need. Just how low can you get your statistical error if you run for a long time? And uh, so if you just took this, you know, random feature, just kept adding more random features into the soup, and do whatever heuristics you want, do you have an idea for when that will So work? it's a complex question because uh, you're doing regularization through two different mechanisms. Yeah, the first is a low rank approximation through the, the number of random features, and the other is given a fixed number of random features, uh, you're doing early stopping, right? And it's not clear to me. But just keep uh, running it. Like, just do whatever you can to keep running it. Because like, uh, it is, by running, you mean increase the number of random? Yeah, because at least in my experience, right. I'm playing a lot of these things. Right. It doesn't seem like you're hitting into, or running into the wall with an right. overfitting issue. It just right. seems like these curves keep going down yes. super slowly. Right. Yes. And, yeah. you know, uh, and the question is, is it really a compactness issue, what's going on in these deep learning, uh, these deep right. neural networks? Right. Versus if you just run this thing with a bottom out at like 20% with some 
you know, ungodly representation size or... I mean, I think it, it's also related to, uh, for instance, it's unfair to compare these methods with, say, convolutional neural nets. Because well, those, yeah, uh, yeah. Like I mean, but that's yeah. important because you can get more compact representations if you, you know, if you're in, in, incorporating prior knowledge invariances and so on and so forth, then uh, you might yeah, that's expect. Fair, that's fair, that's fair. This is more apples to oranges because Take. one can certainly put in these methods with convolutional neural networks. But yeah. just this question, just keep running. Like, what do we get? So I, I think you're back to this uh, shallow versus deep in some sense. Yeah, this is exactly. Uh, and I, I don't have a good answer. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, still uh, not. Uh, uh, I don't know. Like, uh, I think there may be something to it. Uh, so uh, that's why I think some of these kind of deep multi-layer things are also w w worthy of investigation. Okay, so maybe, a, well, obviously there is a lively discussion, but we can take it offline. <laughs> uh, thanks.